He heard the blood singing in his veins. It sometimes seemed so loud that he fancied it prevented his hearing properly certain other sounds that were beginning very faintly to make themselves audible in the depths of the house. Every time he fastened his attention on these sounds, they instantly ceased. They certainly came no nearer. Yet he could not rid himself of the idea that movement was going on somewhere in the lower regions of the house. The drawing room floor, where the doors had been so strangely closed, seemed too near, the sounds were further off than that. He thought of the great kitchen, with the scurrying black beetles, and of the dismal little scullery. But somehow or other, they did not seem to come from there either. Surely they were not outside the house. Then suddenly the truth flashed into his mind, and for the space of a minute he felt as if his blood had stopped flowing and turned to ice. The sounds were not downstairs at all. They were upstairs. Upstairs somewhere among those horrid gloomy little servants' rooms with their bits of broken furniture, low ceilings, and cramped windows upstairs, where the victim had first been disturbed and stalked to her death. And the moment he discovered where the sounds were, he began to hear them more clearly. It was the sound of feet, moving stealthily along the passage overhead, in and out among the rooms, and past the furniture. He turned quickly to steal a glance at the motionless figure seated beside him, to note whether she had shared his discovery. The faint candlelight coming through the crack in the cupboard door threw her strongly marked face into vivid relief against the white of the wall. But it was something else that made him catch his breath and stare again. An extraordinary something had come into her face and seemed to spread over her features like a mask. It smoothed out the deep lines and drew the skin everywhere a little tighter so that the wrinkles disappeared. It brought into the face, with the sole exception of the old eyes, an appearance of youth and almost of childhood. He stared in speechless amazement. Amazement that was dangerously near to horror. It was his aunt's face indeed, but it was her face of forty years ago. The vacant, innocent face of a girl. He had heard stories of that strange effect of terror which could wipe a human countenance clean of other emotions, obliterating all previous expressions. But he had never realized that it could be literally true, or could mean anything so simply horrible as what he now saw. For the dreadful signature of overmastering fear was written plainly in that utter vacancy of the girlish face beside him. And when, feeling his intense gaze, she turned to look at him, he instinctively closed his eyes tightly to shut out the sight. Yet when he turned a minute later, his feelings well in hand, he saw to his intense relief another expression. His aunt was smiling, and though the face was deadly white, the awful wheel had lifted and the normal look was returning. Anything wrong was all he could think of to say at the moment, and the answer was eloquent, coming from such a woman. I feel cold and a little frightened, she whispered. He offered to close the window, but she seized hold of him and begged him not to leave her sight even for an instant. It's upstairs, I know, she whispered, with an odd half laugh, but I can't possibly go up. But Shorthouse thought otherwise, knowing that in action lay their best hope of self-control. He took the brandy flask and poured out a glass of neat spirit, stiff enough to help anybody over anything. She swallowed it with a little shiver. His only idea now was to get out of the house before her collapse became inevitable. But this could not safely be done by turning tail and running from the enemy. Inaction was no longer possible. Every minute he was growing less master of himself, and desperate, aggressive measures were imperative without further delay. Moreover, the action must be taken towards the enemy, not away from it. The climax if necessary and unavoidable, would have to be faced boldly. He could do it now, but in ten minutes he might not have the force left to act for himself, much less for both. Upstairs the sounds were meanwhile becoming louder and closer, accompanied by occasional creaking of the boards. Someone was moving stealthily about, stumbling now and then awkwardly against the furniture. Waiting a few moments to allow the tremendous dose of spirits to produce its effect, and knowing this would last but a short time under the circumstances, 
Shorthouse then quietly got on his feet, saying in a determined voice, Now, Aunt Julia, we go upstairs and find out what all this noise is about. You must come too. It's what we agreed. He picked up his stick and went to the cupboard for the candle. A limp form rose shakily beside him, breathing hard, and he heard a voice say very faintly something about being ready to come. The woman's courage amazed him. It was so much greater than his own, and as they advanced, holding aloft the dripping candle, some subtle force exhaled from this trembling, white-faced old woman at his side that was the true source of his inspiration. It held something really great that shamed him and gave him the support without which he would have proved far less equal to the occasion. They crossed the dark landing, avoiding with their eyes the deep black space over the banisters, then they began to mount the narrow staircase to meet the sounds which, minute by minute, grew louder and nearer. About halfway up the stairs, Aunt Julia stumbled, and Shorthouse turned to catch her by the arm, and just at that moment there came a terrific crash in the servant's corridor overhead. It was instantly followed by a shrill, agonized scream. That was a cry of terror, and a cry for help melted into one. Before they could move aside or go down a single step, someone came rushing along the passage overhead, blundering horribly, racing madly, at full speed, three steps at a time, down the very staircase where they stood. The steps were light and uncertain, but close behind them sounded the heavier tread of another person, and the staircase seemed to shake. Shorthouse and his companion just had time to flatten themselves, against the wall when the jumble of flying steps was upon them, and two persons, with the slightest possible interval between them, dashed past at full speed. It was a perfect whirlwind of sound, breaking in upon the midnight, silence of the empty building. The two runners, pursuer and pursuit, had passed clean through them where they stood, and already with a thought the boar's blue had received first one, then the other, yet they had seen absolutely nothing. Not a hand, or arm, or face, or even a shred of flying clothing. There came a second pause. Then the first one. The lighter of the two, obviously the pursued one, ran with uncertain footsteps into the little room which Shorthouse and his aunt had just left. The heavier one followed. There was a sound of scuffling, gasping, and smothered screaming. And then, out onto the landing came the step of a single person, treading weightily. A dead silence followed for the space of half a minute, and then was heard a rushing sound through the air. It was followed by a dull, crashing thud in the depths of the house below, on the stone floor of the hall. Utter silence reigned after. Nothing moved. The flame of the candle was steady. It had been steady the whole time, and the air had been undisturbed by any movement whatsoever. Palsied with terror, Aunt Julia, without waiting for her companion, began fumbling her way downstairs. She was crying gently to herself, and when Shorthouse put his arm around her and half carried her, he felt that she was trembling like a leaf. He went into the little room and picked up the clock from the floor, and arm in arm, walking very slowly, without speaking a word or looking once behind them, they marched down the three flights into the hall. In the hall they saw nothing, but the whole way down the stairs they were conscious that someone followed them, step by step. When they went faster, it was left behind, and when they went more slowly, it caught them up. But never once did they look behind to see, and at each turning of the staircase, they lowered their eyes for fear of the following horror they might see upon the stairs above. With trembling hands, Shorthouse opened the front door, and they walked out into the moonlight and drew a deep breath of the cool night air blowing in from the sea.